Hello and welcome to Portfolio Matters. In today's share talk, we will be discussing the small UK listed oil development and exploration company, Jersey Oil and Gas. But before we get into it, Richard will read the disclaimer. Thank you, Keith. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. So tell us about Jersey Oil and Gas, Gas Keith. Thank you, Richard. Okay, <clears throat> this is going to be quite a long presentation and it has taken us a long time to put together. Now, one of the benefits of doing the Portfolio Matters podcast is that people send us interesting things. And about a month ago, we were contacted by somebody in the oil industry with information about Jersey Oil and Gas, which we have worked through. Now, we, this presentation will be based on some of his insights, but ultimately, this will be our work. And we will aim to provide our usual balanced view, positive and negatives of the company while giving our opinion. Okay, so Jersey Oil and Gas are a, an exploration and production company, UK listed with assets in the North Sea. In particular, their big development is the Greater Buchan area, which they are currently looking to have funded and farm out for development. So Jersey Oil and Gas, it has a share price of about 165p. Actually, the share price has come off a bit in the last couple of days and probably about £1.45 now. The market cap is 51 million and it has cash. This cash figure is according to Stockopedia and I'm not sure whether that includes the recent fundraise of 15 million in March. So in summary, this is a simple story. Jersey Oil and Gas are attempting to redevelop the Great and Buchan area and at its heart is the Buchan Field. And the Buchan Field is an old field. The Buchan Field was actually exploited for 36 years between 1981 and 2017. And during that time, BP and then Talisman recovered around 36% of the oil in place. Now, Buchan, uh, Jersey Oil and Gas are now saying on the basis of a Schlumberger dynamic modeling of the reservoir that they can recover 54%. And that will require them to recover 50% more oil than BP and Talisman did, including oil below the oil water contact. Now, that may be possible. Schlumberger have done the work and they have got a lot of data. So they've got 36 years worth of data from production of this field. And it is a general rule that the more data you have, the better the modeling. However, the numbers that Schlumberger are reporting are technically recoverable. Those are not the economically recoverable oil. And the question is whether a large oil company will be willing farm into this um, project for the cost of $2 billion, $2 billion sterling, actually. Given that the whole market is moving away from expensive exploration to concentrate on smaller, more predictable projects. Now, you should be aware that when our oil industry contact first got in touch with us, I held these shares. But as I came to understand his concerns about the whether this project was actually economically feasible, I sold those shares. 
Now we are going to try and do this presentation like all our normal presentations in a balanced way and it is up for each of our viewers to make up their own mind. Okay, some information you're going to need in order to understand this presentation and on which I had to educate myself. Right, the first term is an oil industry term, the difference between water wet and oil wet rocks. The diagrams on the left here are water wet rocks. And whether a rock is or a reservoir is water wet or oil wet depends on its geology and the um, mineralogy of the reservoir. Now in a water wet rock, the water coats the particles of the rock. And you can see here that the oil, which is the red, sits away from the rock. The water is coating the rock and the oil is in the gaps between the particles of the rock. So when you then do a water flood, the water runs around the particles and because the oil is not attached to the rock, the oil moves and the water flood can therefore, therefore force the oil out of the reservoir. And so water wet rocks, you have generally high oil recovery factors. We now move to a, an oil wet reservoir. The oil is in contact with the rock. When you then do a water flood, the water doesn't hit the particles of the rock, it instead tries to find its way through. And it will, instead of trying to forcing the oil away from the particles of the rock, it will just find a channel through the rock. And therefore you get very high levels of water production and lower levels of oil production. So the important thing to take away from this is that you have high oil, fuel, oil recovery factors from water wet rocks and low oil recovery factors from oil wet rocks. Now, the other thing you need to know is how the oil industry classifies its reserves. They're split into reserves, contingent resources and prospective resources. Now reserves are oil that you know is there and which you believe is commercially viable to recover. Contingent, contingent resources are resources that you believe are there but may or may not be commercially viable. And prospective resources are is oil that you believe is there by inference, but you haven't actually done the drilling and you're not, you don't know for certain it's there. So within reserves, you have proved, so that is oil you absolutely know for certain is there, or you know with a high degree of certainty is there, probable where it's a decent certainty and possible where there's a low certainty. And these are generally described as P90, P50, and P10. So P90 is there's a 90% chance the oil's there. P50, there's a 50% chance the oil's there. P10, there's a 10% chance the oil's there. And generally what you find is proved are smaller than probable, which is smaller than possible. Okay, moving on to the share price history. Now, if you look on some of the websites, you'll see that Jersey Oil and Gas seems to have a price history going back to 2010, but that is misleading because Jersey Oil and Gas actually took over um, an existing company called Trap Oil and the share price history you will see generally is belongs to Trap Oil. The um, share price history of Jersey Oil and Gas begins on the 14th of August 2015. And if we now look through the history of Jersey Oil and Gas, 
the main events are that in 2016 it farmed out interest in uh, the UK P.2170 license stat oil for 2.1 so 1.2 million dollars which is not a great deal then really the excitement over Jersey oil and gas begins in March 2017 with a competent persons report for the Verbier and Cortina prospects which show large prospective oil reserves oil in place and that sends the share price soaring up to over three pounds bear in mind it is now one pound 65 actually today it's about one pound 45 but then unfortunately they drill the verbier well and in on the 11th of september 2017 it comes up dry however a month later the verbier sidetrack finds oil in an uptrend away from the original verbier well and that sends the share price right back up and there's a share placing at two, two pounds a share however in april 2019 the verbier appraisal well to work out how much oil they have found in verbier is disappointing and they say that the original estimate of 25 to 130 million barrels, the resources will be towards the low end of that estimate, but they have never provided a competent person's report stating exactly how much oil there is in Verbier. Then in 23rd of August 2019, they are awarded further licenses in the uh, UK licensing round, including the Glen Discovery. And then on the 26th of January this year, they announced a 50% increase in the size of the Buchan area contingent resource, which sends the share price up. And then there's a share placing on 17th of March at 165p, raising 15 million. So currently they are well funded with enough funding to hopefully allow them to do the work to create a farm out presentation and try and get a farm in partner and that's where we are now okay so who is our oil industry contact well those of us of a certain age will remember John Wayne as Red Adair on a Sunday afternoon in Hellfighters, battling blowout wells all around the world. So we've decided to call him Red after Red Adair, although he comments he's more Fred Astaire than Red Adair anyway. So he has a, a background in energy and he runs a, a small oil and gas company and therefore has extensive experience and contacts in the industry. And we know that when in providing us with information on Jersey oil and gas, he also consulted with other contacts in the industry. But this is our work. Essentially, we have to take responsibility for what we put out. So company description. So the Buchan, Great Buchan area is in the central North Sea off uh, the coast of Aberdeen. They are saying that they have 172 million barrels of contingent resources and near field exploration portfolio of 230 million of prospective at resources. And this is a closer look at the field. So red is exploration assets and blue is discoveries the big one here is buchan now moving on to buchan now buchan is an old field buchan was developed by bp and then talisman and you can see here the evolution of technology so in 1981 this chart was done using 2d seismic then we have 2014, we have 3D seismic, and now 
we have high resolution 3D seismic. So part of the investment case for Jersey oil and gas is the improvement in technology. And what they are saying is that with improved seismic techniques, modeling techniques, we have a much better understanding of the reservoir than previously. And they go on to say that last year is a defining year for Jersey oil and gas in that they have their previous modeling, which was done by Rockflow, was static modeling, and the new model by Schlumberger lifts the, the estimate of the recoverable oil from Bucken by 50%. But you'll notice that Jersey Oil and Gas has grown over that period to over 20 employees, i.e. previously it was below 20 employees, and it's a small company. Now, one thing that you need to um, be aware of is the shape of the Bucken field, and it is a dome up here, top right, and that's important. Okay, so they are saying that Bucken now has technically recoverable resources of 126 million barrels. Historic production was 148 million barrels. The 126 million is a big step up from the previous competent persons report, which was prepared by Rockpool. And they're saying they can now recover 54% of the oil in place. Now, is that credible? Well, if we look at the numbers for some big fields in the North Sea, actually, the recovery factors in some of these fields have been incredibly high. I mean, Piper, they recovered 80% of the oil, which is, I find, an absolutely astonishing number. But as always, the devil is in the detail. And our contact in the oil industry is saying that the problem with Bucken is the geology. And we know from BP and Talisman that Bucken has a difficult geology, and we will get onto that. But anyway, this is where the fields are in the North Sea, and they're very close to several existing pipelines. So if this were to be developed, it can be easily tied in to the uh, coast of Scotland. So it should not be a difficult development. Jersey Oil and Gas are saying that based on their prospective resources, which you remember are near field exploration assets, so prospective resources, they haven't done the drilling, and the discovered resources they are claiming in the Buchan, Grace Bucken area, there is very substantial upside to the share price. So were you just to value the discovered resources they're claiming at $2 a barrel, then the shares should be worth £13.37, which is obviously an enormous multiple of the current market price, which we will say is £1.69. It's 6.7 times. And the more you value the discovered resources, and the prospective resources, the higher the share price gets. And, you know, that becomes very high multiples of the current share price, essentially. So if Jersey oil and gas are right, and there is a large resource here, the shares are worth a lot of money, prospectively, just on the basis of valuing the oil in place alone. So this does not include any of the per costs of developing the field or operating expenditure, but this is placing a very low multiple on the value of the oil. So, you know, $2 a barrel. Bear in mind that the current oil price is like 60, well, I think Brent is like $67 today. So valuing $2 a barrel, you know, that seems very low. You know, potentially there's enormous upside here if they can get this field developed. And this table shows the 
economics that Jersey Oil and Gas are proposing for the Buchan field. And you can see that there is a cost of development over the course of three years, followed by large cumulative cash flows. Now, one thing that Richard has spotted is that if you look at the cumulative development cash flows, then the, and that's on the right here, the, uh, so with the brown line has an axis on the right, you will see it reaches a low of, what's that? $800,000, but we know that Jersey Oil and Gas are proposing a $2 billion development, and they have recently stated that the phase one development will cost about a billion sterling. So why is this only showing $800 million as the cumulative cash flow, negative cash flow cost of the development? Not sure. But going through their numbers, so they are saying over the course of its development, the um, total revenue would be 8.8 .8 billion. Post-tax cash flow of 3.2 billion. I mean, bear in mind, these shares are one pound 69, the total market cap is 50 million. So, you know, we are talking very, very substantial returns. I mean, obviously there are no costs that you'd have to share this with a farm out partner. Um, Pre-tax NPV of 1.6 billion. And um, yeah, NAV per share, 42 pounds. So the investment case is that if they can get this right, big upside. Okay, let's talk about the Verbier field. Now, since its existence, Jersey Oil and Gas has only had one exploration drilling campaign, and that was the Verbier campaign. So Verbier was part, is part of the Greater Buchan area, and they did, did a lot of 3D seismic. So Buchan is here, Verbier is in the red, and they estimated that, that at 25 to 130 million barrels. They have other prospects, Cortina and Maribel. So this presentation comes from 2018 after they had done the discovery well, and that had come up dry, but before the appraisal well, which was frankly disappointing. But all this was done on the basis of 3D seismic data. And bear in mind that they are now aiming to farm out and develop Buchan on the basis of 3D seismic data and dynamic modeling of the reservoir. And the bottom line is when they, their 3D seismic data of Verbier prior to the appraisal well, they were saying that there was potentially a lot of oil there. In September 2017, they drilled the Verbier exploration well, and that encountered water bearing upper Jurassic sands, but no oil. That happens. You can have drill into a reservoir which looks good and may once have contained oil, but the oil may have escaped or the oil may have migrated elsewhere or never been there in the first place. But then a month later, they announced that they had found oil in a sidetrack at Verbier in an up dip of the water bearing sands encountered in the initial well. And they then stated that they thought there would be between 25 and 130 million barrels of oil equivalent in Verbier. But then in 2019, they did an appraisal well and they did not encounter the upper Jurassic sands as anticipated. And as a result, they have had to lower their estimate of the initial resource to the lower end of their original range. So towards 25 million, 
rather than 25 to 130 million. But they have never released a CPR, competent person report, on Verbier. So we don't know. But the important thing I want to take away from this is despite all the um, 3D seismic, that not only did they not find oil, but they failed to encounter the upper Jurassic sands as anticipated. So, you know, you can do all the dynamic modeling, the um, 3D modeling you like from, you know, seismic, but until you actually drill the well, there is a great deal of uncertainty. All the kind of modern computer techniques are not infallible. Now, moving on to the Buchan field. Now, the Buchan field has a long history. Texco drilled the first well back in 1974 and a further three wells in the area in the subsequent two years. But the tests revealed an extremely complex and fractured field that was difficult to extract from. BP became the operator in 1977 and BP found this a difficult well. And the problems were severe enough that actually two senior engineers published a paper about Buchan in the Society of Petroleum Engineers, but they drilled nine wells um, for production, seven central and two satellites, but all those apparently were vertical. And one of the differences between what they did and what Jersey Oil and Gas are proposing to do is Jersey Oil and Gas are planning to do laterals to get, which have a much better contact area with the reservoir. And I believe is something they probably couldn't do back in the 70s when this was developed. Now, initial expect expectations were quite low for this field. They expected a five year life and production of 50 million barrels. And production commenced in 1981 and peak production was in May 83 at 32,000 barrels. They then, as the field declined, they did a water flood and a gas lift. And they managed to massively improve the life of this field. Bear in mind, it was originally due to last five years. And actually, they ran it for 26 years. And the reason Talisman, who took over the running of the field, the reason they stopped production of the field was not because it was no longer producing. It was producing there is still oil in Buchan. They were still producing 3,500 barrels a day, which is very substantial actually in the context of the modern North Sea. But my understanding is that when BP originally developed the field, they only expected it to last five years and they wanted to develop it as cheaply as possible. So they used a reconditioned drilling rig rather than a bespoke explore, uh, production rig. And as a result, when it was 26 years old, that is five times longer than they were expecting to, to it to last. And it was getting rather old and it failed a, a safety certificate. Okay, let's quickly talk about Buchan geology. I spent an hour on the phone last night with a senior reservoir engineer from a FTSE 100 oil company. And he took me through a lot of things I'd previously not understood about oil recovery rates. And the one thing we know about the Buchan field is that BP and Talisman reported that it had low porosity, low permeability, but it was highly fractured. Now, this diagram here, which our oil industry contact has sent us, is from an academic piece which shows how oil and water flow through different rocks. And if you remember our first um, discussion about oil wet and water wet rocks, so we expect oil to flow much more easily through water wet rocks. And top left is a water wet rock. And water is being pushed through left to right. And you can see in a strongly water wet rock, the water is flowing through the rock and it's pushing the oil out to the right. Now, in a, an oil wet rock, the water has real trouble flowing through the rock and it will preferentially just flow through the fractures. 
And that is exactly what you're seeing. You see that blue line is water flowing through the, the fractures and around the rock. And these are pictures from Jersey Oil and Gas showing the rock that they're encountering in the Buchan field. And in particular, top left here is a fracture. Now, in discussions with my friend in the oil industry last night, he was explaining that when you have low porosity and low permeability rock, which is highly fractured, the water will flow preferentially through the fractures as expected, but you will get potentially very high recovery rates from the fractures, but low recovery rates from the rock. And so the recovery from the field in totem will depend on the ratio of fractures in the rock. And we don't know. Schlumberger have done that work. But BP and Talisman were running this field for 36 years. And they had water flowing through that rock. And you would have to ask how what Schlumberger think that Jersey oil and gas can do to get 50% more oil out, given that the oil in the fractures is relatively easy to move and is likely to have moved already. Now, as we've discussed, the Buckenfield was developed using this rig here, a pentagonal designed floater. And Concerns were raised about its structural integrity by as it became, you know, five times older than it was uh, expected to last. Essentially, it failed a safety, safety test and Talisman considered it uneconomic to commission a new rig, essentially, and closed it down. But by that stage, it was still um, producing three and a half thousand barrels a day. So there's absolutely oil in Buchan. The question is how you get it out and whether it is economic, whether you can get it out in an economic manner. Now, this is the Jersey oil and gas presentation on Bucken. And they are saying that in the initial development in the 80s, there are nine vertical producers and two water disposal wells. They did a gas lift and their redevelopment today would they would have three to six producers and two water injectors and they'd do um, a gas lift and use electric submersible pumps. And this is a diagram of their plans. So they are proposing these wells here, which you'll see are diagonal, whereas, you know, the technologies they had previously when these well was initially produced was you could only drill vertically. So you'll see all the BP wells are vertical. And that will undoubtedly, it should lift to um, production. And I managed to track down the uh, chart of buck and field production, which I was quite pleased with by digging around on the internet. And what this shows is the black line is barrels produced and the blue line has the right hand scale and is the water cut. And if you remember oil wet rocks, if you do a water flood, you tend to get very high water cuts. And that is exactly what you're seeing. And look at this decline. That looks like steady natural decline. So the question really is, how will Jersey Oil and Gas in the new development lift this production and reverse this decline rate and get essentially 50% more oil out of the reservoir, so 54% of original oil in place, when BP and Talisman over 26 years got around 37%. When we look at the um, history of this field, the oil water contact moved over the life of the field as BP and Talisman 
took oil out. Now, obviously, oil is lighter than water. So as you take the oil out, the oil moves up to the top of the dome. You remember Buchan is a dome and the water moves up behind it. So this shows you how far the oil water contact moved. And as I was researching this, I was puzzled because Jersey oil and gas are stating that they can recover 126 million barrels of oil, but BP recovered 148. Now, that's a ratio of about one oil barrel left and recoverable to 1.2 produced. But you see that over the course of the life of this uh, reservoir, extraction from this reservoir, the oil water contact moved from 1,900 feet to 734 feet. So there's only about a th the top third of the reservoir has oil in it. So if you just think about things um, volumetrically. Can I just chip in, Keith? I just, yep. um, you know, if you look at the, um, the plans for the, for the angled wells, of course, they yeah. are angling through the, the previously sort of extracted in inverted commas areas, aren't they? Yes. And presumably that, that's one of their strategies for increasing the oil production from, from the areas that have already been tapped. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the thing is, the, one of the advantages of doing laterals is you increase the area of the uh, well in contact with the oil. And, you know, it's undoubtedly true that you know, modern lateral wells were, should lead to higher recovery rates, you would hope. But mm. whether you can get the recovery rate for 37% to 54%, I find that questionable. And I think yeah, it's, so it's the a, question, it's the a question thing. is, with their enhanced techniques, can they get that extra um, 18% 18, 18 that was not got the first time through? That's right. But that 18% is basically you're talking about a 50% increase on your 36% original recovery rate. That's enormous. I mean, that is very easy to say we can do this, but you know, how, how are they going to do this? I mean, that is what we don't know. Now, anyway, going back to my analysis. So you said basically that only the top third of this dome has, is above the oil water contact now. So that is probably what, you know, we're only about a, a fifth of the uh, reservoir, but volumetrically has, um, is above the oil water contact. And- Yeah, but aren't they saying that some of the, the, the reservoir that is below the oil water contact with the new recovery, they have access to that oil. Isn't that the- Yes. Isn't that no, the point? That's absolutely right, Richard. Very good point. We need, absolutely need to make that clear is that they need to recover 54% of the oil from the entire reservoir. Yeah? Yeah, of the original oil that was there. The original oil in place. Yeah, so they need to recover 54%, this is what we think, 54% yes. of what is above the oil water interface and and the and eighteen percent of what was originally below what is now the oil water interface, yes. and which has been partially extracted. That's exactly right. So they're going back and saying we can increase the recovery of the un, of the unexploited area to fifty four percent, and we can we can get more oil out of what has already been ex exploited. Precisely, that's correct. Yeah, and the question is clearly. How can they do? Can they do that? That's exactly right. So essentially, what Richard has just said is a good summary of the situation. But to go back to my original analysis, so there's only between 60 and 110 million barrels of oil in place above the current oil water contact. So how then are they saying that they can recover 126 million barrels? Well, clearly, what Richard is saying is correct. What they have done is they have said, 
we can recover 54% of all the oil in the rev reservoir. And they have just stated that as a fact. And then it's quite easy to work out what they've done. So there's been no change to the original oil in place, which remains 507 million barrels. So if you then do the maths, you just apply this stated 54% oil recovery rate, that gives you the total oil barrels of oil recovered. You then subtract the 148 million barrels produced by BP and Talisman, and that gives you the amount of oil remaining, which, because they have stated a 54% recovery rate, they, they say they're going to get that, but it all depends on that assumption. They're just a stated assumption of 54%. But what if we used other recovery rates? Now, apparently the Clare field has similar geology. They had a 30% recovery rate. And if you apply that, then there's only 4 million barrels there. Now, frankly, we know that's wrong because the... Um, BP and Talisman managed to recover 36, 37%. So if we apply that, then there's around 44 million barrels left. Now, the trouble with 44 million barrels is their development plans where they're aiming to spend capex of a billion pounds on phase one. That's just not economic. It doesn't get developed at 44 million. Richard? You going to say something? Um, yeah, I was going to say, Keith, you know, clearly there's a key assumption, isn't it? And can they achieve the recovery rate of 54%? That's, that's fundamental to the, um, the economics of this field. And in some senses, it's un untested and it can't be tested until they spend money. Um, I mean, I don't know, are they able to test the, test the recovery by drilling some uh, angled wells without going to the expense of putting in a new rig? I don't know. Well, the thing is, Richard, that can't really comes down to the heart of the matter. Because, yes, you can. Absolutely, you can do some more appraisal wells. And you can test the uh, field. But that's not what they're proposing. Right now, they're proposing to farm out and develop the field. So, and, and presumably, presumably, the people who they go to farm out will have to take your viewers to whether they think the 54% is, is reason, sufficiently accurate or whether they want more appraisal wells to be drilled in order to give them more give them sufficient confidence to go ahead. Precisely, yeah. So it could well be that they, um, instead of farming out the two billion for development, you farm out um, for a lesser sum to do some more appraisal wells. Yeah. But that is not what they're doing. Right now they're doing, you know, front end, front end engineering and development. So they're actually you know, trying to design the, the um, drilling rig, et cetera, et cetera. They're not trying to follow. So they're, going ahead on, they're yeah. currently going ahead on the basis of, of their published material. They're going ahead on the basis that they can do it in one hit effectively. They can do the two billion farm out and away they go. And if yes. they can't, then they would have to do more, more exploratory wells, more appraisal wells to determine whether their recovery assumptions are accurate. Yeah, that's right. So this chart really gets to the heart of the matter. Between 2017 and 2021, the reserves, the re resources in the Greater Buchan area have grown 40-fold. But the amount of oil originally in place has not changed at all. And the only wells that they have drilled were the Verbier discovery and appraisal wells, which were disappointing. So you really have to believe on the basis of the 3D seismic and the dynamic modeling that they're gonna get be able to get a lot more oil out of this reservoir than BP and Talisman were, and they had experience of the well for 26 years. And this is the rock pool competent person's report, report, which was static, and they were saying mid-case 95 million barrels. And then two years later, Schlumberger do this dynamic reservoir modeling, they up it by 50%. But bear in mind, these say 
these are contingent resources and technically recoverable resources. They do not say whether they're economically recoverable resources. Because if you look back at the chart showing the decline rate, and if you were to continue producing that well forever, presumably you produce a hell of a lot of oil, but at some stage it becomes uneconomic. I mean, you, you could run it for the next 200 years and you'd probably still be getting a couple of barrels out. But the reality is you would, still, you would have stopped long before that. So the current plan is for a 2 billion development of an old, small to medium sized, difficult North Sea oil field when the whole of the industry is moving away from expensive and risky exploration plays. And so, you know, you will know that BP have downsized their oil and gas exploration team from 700 people to 100 people as they move the whole uh, business towards wind farms and solar. And last week, the Austrian oil company, OMV, essentially divested of its Malaysian assets to an oil company I own, Jade Stone, for nothing or less than nothing when the deal closes. And why would you invest 2 billion in the North Sea when you can invest 1.6 million to drill a shale oil well and you know exactly what your economics are, basically? You know, it's a much smaller field, but this is the way the industry is going. Much sm smaller, more certain developments when if you look at the history of the oil, oil industry over the last 10 years, the oil cycles have been violent and a lot of people have lost money. So you concentrate so, on... So, so what we're saying really, Keith, is that the farm out plan, whilst um, if it works and if the, if the recovery that is, is achievable, it's great. They may, they may struggle with the farm out plan simply because of the high capital expenditure. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Well done, Richard. Yes, sorry. And there's a danger, obviously. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so moving on. Thank you, Richard, for cutting me as I rambled. Um, Jersey Oil and Gas, these are the um, accounts which, frankly, are completely un uninformative because, obviously, it's never had any revenues apart from some farm-out um, profits. And it's unlikely to until they get this thing farmed out and developed. And even in the best case scenario, it would take three years to develop. So, you know, you're now talking about no revenues until at least 2024. So anyway, but they've got some cash. Okay, positives and negatives. Right, they've done a fundraise recently, which was successful. And they have cash and they have cash to um, do work on the uh, feed front end engineering and development and to work on the farm out. There is certainly oil in Buchan. When Talisman stopped producing in 2017, it was still producing three and a half thousand barrels a day. So you can certainly have an economic development of Buchan. There's oil there. And if the work that Jersey Oil and Gas have done and the recoverable resource estimates are correct, then the shares are undervalued. And when you look at the table which we have covered, then Jersey Oil and Gas give an NAV per share of £13.37, which is 6.6 .6 times the current market price. If you just value the discovered resources that they claim at $2 a barrel alone, that's if you don't put any value on the prospective resources, which remain undiscovered. So if you believe the numbers, these shares are seriously undervalued. OK, negatives. Well, the whole investment case relies upon the increased recovery factor on Buchan rising to f get to 54%. And that, my understanding is, that is pretty much the technically feasible maximum. And if any downside from that will substantially impact on the economics. And, but above all, this is an expensive development 
in an area where there have been a lot of disappointments recently and the whole industry is moving away from these um, high risk exploration plays and towards lower risk, more certain plays. And in the case, in fact, lots of companies are just getting out of the oil space altogether. So there's less capital available to the industry full stop. And if they fail to farm out, what's left? Oh, what, what is left, you think, Keith? If they fail to farm out, are they able to develop it in a, in a slower way? Is, is there capacity? Yes, I think they are. Yeah, no, I think they are. I think they, they almost certainly could. But I mean, the, the reality is... If, they changes, don't have... if it changes the business model that, that yes. they're currently moving ahead, moving along, yeah. Yeah, that's it. I mean, essentially, they're, they're trying to do this big. They're going big. And actually... They're investing their limited resources and the resources of shareholders, they've raised from shareholders in doing, doing this big, where actually, you know, what, we're, what I'm saying is really, I mean, you could do this small and it, I think it'd be easier to do. And we're saying that in our, in our view, the 54% is probably the top end of what they might successfully recover. So the risk is that it, it's less, not more. And with the Verbier well, um, effect, the Verbier field effectively failing current uh, current position is it's not working um there is uh, there's doubt there's uncertainty within the entirety of of the field yeah yeah i think that's that's pretty much a good summary richard let's leave it there well thank you very much keith i know you've put quite a lot of time and effort into developing this uh, presentation and i think it's really interesting because it shows the difficulties um in trying to assess the, um, the risks and rewards of a small oil company that has um, no revenues, but is trying to develop, whether it's a new field or, or pre-existing field on different assumptions, it shows the, how difficult it is to balance the, um, the information that you receive with the risk of your investment. So I think it's a really interesting sort of case study of the difficulties of investing in some of these resource companies. Yes. And can I just also thank Red, our oil industry contact, for uh, reaching out to us with this story. And I really appreciate it with people who, when people with much more expertise with me can't make contact. And I, when I first looked at this, I realized I thought he was right and I sold my shares. Now, it's up to everyone who views this to make up their own mind. But the other thing I'd say is that when I was looking at the broken notes on Jersey oil and gas, they were all just repeating the recoverable numbers as though they were gospel. And this whole presentation has basically been querying whether those numbers are over optimistic and no, none of the brokers were doing that work. And so once again, it makes me wonder whether, you know, because one thing we know about brokers is that they have this symbiotic relationship with the um, companies where they need them for work and they're, they're loath to criticize them. And so once again, you wonder whether how much worth there is in broker's notes, actually. As a, as a, as a general point. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all for, for watching and for making it through to the end. I hope you found that useful. I hope you will subscribe and press like. And in the meantime, it's goodbye from Richard Wheater. And it's goodbye from Keith Jordan. Goodbye. Goodbye. Full disclaimer, the material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. 
We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages, or for any results obtained from the use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.